Okay, good. Let me get started then. Uh, this is a pep talk to motivate you to try something out, which I tried in springtime. That is to look at lunar impact flashes. And I, I claim that they are almost like meteors. Um, why do I claim that? Well, the first thing is lunar impact flashes look cool. There is a video recording on the right here where there's a flash appearing on the upper part of the moon. And uh, this is sort of playing in a loop, so it will come back again. They don't happen very often. It's just like a bright fireball where every once in a while you say, hey, fantastic, I'm glad I saw that. They're super interesting for science, uh, but there is an issue. The issue is there are not enough observers. Galina would say we need more data. And I will outline my thoughts a bit on first why we all should be observing lunar impact flashes. I tell you how I started doing it. And then I tell you, uh, I don't know what I tell you. We'll see when I get there. So first, a, a really scientifically looking cool slide. So flux densities of meteoroids. This is why we need to observe more lunar impact flashes. And the same argument holds is this is why we need to observe more fireballs. What you see here on the x-axis is the meteoroid mass in kilograms, or in other words, the, the diameter in meters, if I assume some average density. So this actually goes to asteroids because anything larger than 10 to the zero meters officially we call an asteroid. And uh, the green area, which is now shown on the screen, that's the part that we expect to be visible on the moon as impact flashes when we look at the dark side of the moon with the telescope. This is also roughly the range where we see bright fireballs. And that's why I'm also keen on, on having many, many fireball observation networks out there. Why do we need to know what's going on there? Well, you know that my daytime job is that, that I'm running the Planetary Defense Office of the European Space Agency, where we deal with the potential threats from asteroids or large meteoroids on, onto our planet. And people want to know about what's going on. Even if it's a one meter fireball, we are supposed to tell them. The flux densities, so the expected number of objects that you see per area and time, in particular in this green range, is not very well constrained. Uh, there's like an order of magnitude still uncertainty. And there's some work like by Peter Brown and, and others to constrain that. And I think we are not yet there. We need to know even better how many objects there are. So observe fireballs, set up your cameras, de-bias the data properly, but I'm arguing also look at the moon. Now, what do we see on the moon? Well, okay, just like uh, the Earth's atmosphere, if you have a meteoroid coming in and hitting the moon's surface, uh, something will happen. The meteoroid will be stopped. It will convert the energy into a big impact crater or a small impact crater, and part of the energy will be converted to light. So this is my equation that I'm showing in this slide. There's kinetic energy, and then there is, again, something like luminous efficiency, as we heard from Peter Brown, uh, only this time for impact light flashes. And we get a light flash, as we see in this little video on the upper right. Now, there, there are two things. One is you see the light flash, the other one, and this is really cool too, you can actually occasionally find the impact crater that was formed on the moon. And that's something you see in the lower right of this slide. It's just uh, an animation of two slides. One is taken before and the other one after an observed impact flash in that area on the moon. There was a Spanish group recording a super bright impact flash. And when people checked the data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter from an orbiting camera around the moon at two different time slots, you could actually see a fresh impact crater in the data. That gives us an additional way to constrain what happens really there just by looking at the size of the impact crater. So there we are. This is good. That's why we do it. Now, how do we do it? Well, this is something where you do want to have a telescope because these impact flashes, they occur 
Well, I can give you some numbers. The NASA Meteorite Office, Meteorite Environment Office was operating or is still operating a few 12 inch, 14 inch telescopes. On average, if you look at the publications, they see uh, an impact flash roughly about two to three hours of observing time. We have a project in Greece where we use a 1.2 meter telescope. Admittedly, that's quite large. That would, I wouldn't count as an amateur instrument anymore. That recorded on average about an impact flash every hour. That sounds like a lot, but I'll show you in a minute that it's difficult to actually look at the dark side of the moon for an hour. But before I do that, this is my setup. I'm using a camera, this camera actually, it's a QHY GPS something. I put it in the view graph. It's a QHY 174mm. And I'm using a, an old 10 inch F4 Newtonian that's actually a relic of a telescope that I built when I was 17. It's right now it's up there. And I, it started out as a Cassegrain telescope, a 10 inch F, I forgot 16 Cassegrain or something. I modified it to a Newtonian because now it has the right focal length so that the moon just fills the detector of this camera. I, you know, I have, I have a larger telescope too, which of course would collect more light, but then I only see part of the moon because simply the detector is too small to, to give me an image of the whole moon. So there's some trade off there between the, the field of view that you have on the moon and the aperture. The second thing is this, is what I mentioned already before, here's the real issue. You want to look at the dark side of the moon. And I do mean the dark side also called the unilluminated side. I do not mean the far side, don't mix it up, right? The far side is the one we can never see from the earth, it's on the other side. But I'm really talking about the dark side, so the side which is not illuminated. Why? Because the signal to noise of an impact flash is uh, much higher if I look at the unilluminated side compared to looking at the illuminated side. The best time when I see all of the dark side of the moon is uh, during new moon. Now the disadvantages, this is a photograph of the new moon on, uh, uh, in June this year. And there was a lunar eclipse, no, sorry, a solar eclipse. So that actually means that the moon, the new moon is of course only visible during daytime. Again, there I have the problem of signal to noise. If I try to see something which is fifth magnitude, sixth magnitude, I cannot really see it. So you have to find a time where the moon is just partially illuminated. It's a thin sickle. Then you look at the dark side of the moon, but then of course you can only observe for say half an hour or so until the moon sets. And that's why in the end, for example, our Greek project, they have been operating now for four years and they, they get paid for that. So every time it's possible, they look at the moon with their telescope and they accumulated something like 169 observing hours only so far. That's why we need many more observers. Here's the issue, the, the second issue, if I have more than say a 50% illuminated moon, stray light in the telescope, in the atmosphere will also mess up my observations. This is just a photograph with my mobile phone it taken two seconds apart and by tilting it a bit, it changed the exposure time. Here you can nicely see the so-called dark side of the moon, which is not really dark because of earth shine. And you also see all this stray light that we have here. So how do we improve this? Well, there are just you know, a handful of people that currently are out there observing. There's this Greek program where we wrote nice papers there published in astronomy and astrophysics. There are a few amateurs that you know, observe one impact flash and then give up. Uh, there are a few professionals that try that. I think we should be doing this in a more organized way. And the first thing which I realized what's really missing is a good detection software for impact flashes. There is something available, there's a link here, but okay, that's a bit old fashioned. You need to save everything in an ABI format then split it up in BMPs and whatnot. So we decided that we will develop a new 
a new software by these people that do these professional observations. They, uh, with them, we will actually kick off the contract next week. I think on Wednesday, they have funding for uh, paying a software developer for one year to take the detection software that they have for their super big telescope with Ixon something CMOS cameras and modify it such that it can be used with any camera, with this one or with uh, the one we saw before by Bill Ward, like the ASI camera. And so any camera you have, we want to be able to use. And uh, since a few months, we actually have this concept of open source software, even in the European Space Agency. So this is a contract where we force them to produce something which then in the end, they have to put publicly available on GitLab and everybody can look at it, can modify it and so on. Uh, so that's part number one, which I think is important. And the second part is I need to motivate people to perform these observations. And that's why I'm talking about this to you right now. So this is my setup. It's actually in the garden right behind, uh, behind this wall here. And this is my telescope. This is the big telescope, that's B12, where we used to do asteroid observations and other things. But that telescope in there, it's a 16 inch F10 Casagra. It has a too long focal length. You only see a super small part of the moon there, at least with, with this camera. So I just do it there with this 10 inch. And here you see, if you look closely, there's the moon right up there, that little thing here. And there is an old Sky 7 camera, Mike, hello, yes. And uh, this is how it looks like when the camera is connected to the telescope. One of the things we, you need to do is, of course, you need to find out what's the magnitude you can actually see. And the experts will immediately recognize that this is the constellation of, of Juhus and this cloud of dots here, that's the, I forgot what the name is now. Uh, okay, there, there's some popular name for, for the star cluster here, Christmas cluster, something like that. I forgot now. And if I look at this with my camera setup, then it turns out that this uh, cluster nicely just fits into the field of view. And it has a lot of stars starting at fifth magnitude going down to eight tenths magnitude. So I can now play with the gain settings, the exposure time, all this stuff. You know, you see it's a CMOS camera by these horizontal stripes in there. So that means I crank the gain up a, a lot, but otherwise you don't see very much because of course I also want to record with a sort of a video frame, very similar to our meteor observations. And uh, with that, I can estimate that with my setup, I would see like impact flashes down to eight magnitude or something like that, which should probably will not give me one flash every three hours. Maybe I need a bit longer than that. Can about well, one of the things that that you will see if you go to the link that I showed before the detection software that's provided there you need to record on a video on your disk and then the detection is done offline. I thought we can do better knowing that Zirko managed to write detection software which ran on my 200 megahertz DOS computer 30 years ago. Um, but right now we don't have software available, at least not to my knowledge, except maybe lunar scan, but also that is very difficult to get running on a non-DOS computer. Uh, which actually does that in real time. So I tried recording on, a, on an SSD hard disk, which you see to the right, a solid state disk. And I can do that. If I don't do that, I mean, just to give you a number with this camera, after 50 minutes, my hard disk is full. I have to admit, I made the mistake of getting a computer with only one terabyte of disk, but okay. Uh, so now what I found out is with this SSD, solid state disk, you can actually record directly to the disk. That's fast enough. If you don't have a solid state disk, it won't be fast enough for the, for the camera. Then you can, of course, bin or reduce or something or compress. But if you want uncompressed, that's the way to do it. To me, the conclusion is, okay, we need to tell the Greek people that they have to make their detection software working in real time just to reduce the data volume, because I don't want to buy hundreds of these, or well, hundreds I don't need, but maybe five or six of these disks, because each one of them costs a lot of money. 
So this is what I found out, what needs to be considered. Uh, the moon elevation, it's often very low. So I was thinking of moving to the equator. We'll see, we managed to go to Southern Germany and maybe that's better. Uh, I mentioned the data generation. I had a dark spot in the middle of the moon at some point until I realized it's my coma corrector. So I took that out. There were some reflections in this coma corrector. So now I don't have a coma corrector in there. I don't know what's better with or without. Uh, I realized that tracking the moon is, is not straightforward. I have this button on my mount, which sets it to lunar rate, but all it does, it slows it down a bit in, in right ascension. It doesn't track the moon in north-south, and this is super fast. I mean, the moon moves up to a few arc minutes per hour in north-south direction. So if just like here, the moon just fits into your field of view, you have to correct every five or 10 minutes, which I don't want to do. I want this to run by itself. So there's some work to do. Uh, gain and exposure time settings versus frame rate. I mentioned this brightness calibration thing, still have to work on that. We might need a central data archive if you have many people. So this will actually be part of a discussion at one of the next Fireball workshops funded by Europlanet. We will start talking about this a bit. So those are the things I did. And uh, just some nice pictures here of the nicely illuminated house of my neighbor who decides that it's cool to have the outside wall of his house illuminated. That's the nice thing about observing the moon. The moon is even brighter. So it doesn't matter that this guy, uh, you know, wastes photons and energy and whatnot. It's okay, I can still see the moon. So this is really good. On the left, you see a photograph of the laptop where the most of the illuminated part of the moon is on the top. And there you see myself. And with that, I say thank you very much. And from now on, I expect, you know, at least 10 people sending me emails. Hey, let me know when I can download this software. I want to better test it. I want to participate.